Oh, there. There we go. All right. We're all set up. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Conservatish episode 131. My name is Peter Feliciano, and I'm your host, as always. And uh, make sure you subscribe wherever you're listening. Go ahead and leave a review and comment. Uh, you can feel free to fight with either one of us on comments. I'm sure it'll be a wi wild debate, um, although I am correct all the time, just to let you know in advance. Um, and uh, it is my great privilege uh, to be speaking with Anne Shuffle Corey. Thank you so much, Anne, for coming on the show. Thank you for having me, Peter. Yes. Now, uh, there are a lot of people, and I'm one of them, who did not know about uh, your work or, or uh, your mother's work uh, up until uh, a few, you know, I think until this, um, this series started uh, being made, this Mrs. America starring Kate Blanchett and Tracy Ullman. Um, and I actually, I actually, I got to tell you, as a huge fan of Kate Blanchett, it's a big, it's a big kind of, uh, I really, really love her. And Tracy Ullman's really funny too. Rose Byrne, I don't care about it at all. Um, you know, uh, well, Kate Blanchett uh, is an excellent actress. She really is. With some of my favorite movies are her. Um, but you know, at, at the same time, I can easily, uh, one of the things I've worked on, uh, so a little bit about this show that you're on now, a little bit about me. Um, I uh, started this show because even though I'm, you know, I'm, I'm half Puerto Rican and I have gay family members and I'm, you know, and I'm, uh, I've, you know, I do enjoy very crazy uh, uh, free speech and crazy uh, comedy, um, which I'm, I've talked to your representative. We're not going to be cussing at all. It's going to be nice and clean today. Um, but uh, I also was living in the Bay Area at the time. I just moved to New York about uh, five months ago. And I was living in the Bay Area and uh, in the Bay Area, just like New York, but it's a lot worse in the Bay Area. You have to believe one thing publicly. You have to be a 100% feminist, no matter what that definition is, and it changes all the time. You have to 100, you cannot be into guns at all. You cannot what be- What happened to be, liberty and free speech? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> and so, I called it, I, I wanted to have a place to rant and make foul jokes and, and, and talk to guests of all shapes and sizes and, and uh, political backgrounds. And so I, I called it conservatish. I always say, you know, one of the taglines for me is why can't I like, you know, like gay people and guns at the same time? Why can't I, you know, maybe, you know, have a trans friend, but not want to uh, clamp down on language, you know? Um, and so, um, you know, I've had people of all walks of life, and and, I, and it is a, a privilege to have you on. Um, it sounds like, Peter, you are a believer in liberty. I am. I am. Yes, ma'am. And um, fundamentally, liberty is a conservative value. Yeah, you know what? I did not know that up until about a year and a half ago. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, because the way I grew up in the 90s, 80, 80, late 80s, 90s, I was always seeing only one version or one... Um, uh, one uh, uh, message from conservatives from my end, it was the people who were wanting to take down, um, uh, you know, wanting to take down Ice-T because of his hor horrible lyrics and his rap songs. You know, it was it was that type of thing. Although it was Tipper Gore, actually, who I'm assuming Gore was a Democrat. But anyway, um, it was one one message. And, you know, I think it's normal. It's natural when you're young to be to be more liberal and who cares and doesn't matter and who needs tradition and who cares where we've been, whatever. Um, and, uh, and to, you know, now that I'm in my thirties, it, it makes more sense. I've been, I slowed down a little bit. I'm very, I'm very rebellious in my own right uh, to want to, you know, as soon as everybody believes one thing, I immediately kind of <laughs> take the opposite tack uh, to my detriment sometimes. But um you know, I, uh, it was really interesting reading about your work and reading about, uh, watching videos about uh, your mother's work as well. Um, well, you were you too could. young to remember the original fight in the 1970s. So this is all new to you. This is all new to me. Yes. Mm -hmm. Although one of the things that I, one of the things that especially, I'm sure you, maybe you've seen some of the, some of the videos on the ERA recently, when it came to John Oliver or Trevor Noah on The Daily Show, have you had a chance to see any of that? I did not see those. You're better off. Uh, because I started, I started watching some of those videos to see, okay, what's the argument here? The argument from their end is always with a level of condescension 
and of courseness, meaning like, of course you believe in, of, in ERA, of course you, you know, of course, of course, uh, it's very hipster politics. Um, well, and that's in what the original, me. in the 1970s, it, my mother called it, what's wrong with equal rights? Because if you say the phrase equal rights, who can be against equal rights? It's yeah. when you look at the results and what would happen when you right. realize that under ERA, women would lose. Right. And that's the same thing. It's it's our definitions. It's our words that we use, and we need to be careful when it comes to the words that we use. Like as you know, as an example, who would be who would be against um, you know uh, you know the NRA wants to wants to make it okay to to murder kids. It's like no no you no they don't. You know where everybody across the line, no matter where you are politically, wants free freedom of speech, freedom of. I mean, Phyllis, uh, your mother said it over and over and over again that she wanted free um, or equal pay for equal work, you know, and yet to be against feminism means by their definition means that you don't want women to have equal pay for equal work. It's, it's really, it's insane. I, and I, the equal pay for equal work law passed in 1963, what, a, what is frequently talked about today would actually be equal pay for unequal work. Because if, if a man er works 80 hours a week and a woman works 30 hours a week, they're not doing the same job. Right. And if Meryl Streep goes out for a job and I go out for a job, who's going to get paid more? Meryl Streep should get paid more because she's put in the hours, she's put in the time, she's gotten the awards, she's gotten, she's leveled up. And when it it's a question artists, of whether there is equality of outcomes rather than equality yes. of opportunities. Yes, and that's what bothers me about the stars, the male stars saying, "Okay, you know what? I'll defer. I'm. I'll be. I'll take. I only want to work if the, if a woman makes the exact amount." It's like, well, what is her what is her resume? What is her <laughs> what has her experience been? Has she won the awards that the male has? You know, all this equal even Steven stuff is it bothers me greatly. Um, so I think we should celebrate the differences between men and women because the differences are beautiful. Yeah, they are. And they're natural, too. And I don't mean natural because sometimes you say the word natural like, uh, you know, a lot of my fans, um, you know, every episode is very different when it comes to my show. And a lot of my fans would be more much more left-leaning and then sometimes secretly agreeing with everything I say or right-leaning, but then I say something a little too liberal in there. You know, I like to kind of splash around in that. But um, one of the things that um, that I do believe is that it is kind of natural. Like, I've done a lot of street research when it comes to talking with females both on this show and off the show about, you know, as much as, uh, as an example, as much as the feminism, you can be raw, raw feminist, but when it comes to um relationships often not all the time for sure not all the time um but often uh, uh females want a strong male they want a male that they can feel like okay he can protect me and my children he, on the streets that he's not afraid of me he's not he's not a wimp he's not a pushover you know so there's it's a well-known phenomenon peter that women like to marry men who have more money or earn more money than they do Mm. It's called hypergamy. Hypergamy. Yes, okay. that's marrying up. Okay, I like that. All right, hypergamy. I yes, that makes women. Money. Women want to. Women want to marry men who make more money. So they can provide. So they can protect. So they can. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. So you started, um, or you, uh, your mother started the Eagles, right? Eagle Forum is the name of the organization. Eagle Forum. Right. And it was started in 1975 as an outgrowth of the battle to defeat the Equal Rights Amendment. Now, the Equal Rights Amendment, as as we were just talking about, sounds like, well, of course you want equal rights. But what were the, some of the drawbacks of the Equal Rights Amendment for your mother's definition? Well, ERA would not put women in the Constitution. It puts sex in the Constitution. And although we had a pretty good idea of what sex was in the 1970s, I don't know how to define sex today. It seems to be constantly redefined. In fact, there are a couple of cases in front of the Supreme Court today 
on what is the definition of sex in Title VII, and does sex also mean sexual orientation and gender identity? So I think these are some of the unknowns with the vague and poorly written language of the so-called Equal Rights Amendment. Okay. Uh, along with that, in that Equal Rights Amendment, uh, again, the idea of equal rights, absolutely a great idea. But when I when I did a little research into the 14th Amendment, number one, it seems like we already had that. Uh, yes. Equal Rights Amendment does not say anything about uh, uh, black or white. It just, or I'm sorry, the uh, 14th Amendment says all persons. That Correct. Includes, and last I checked, women are persons. Yes, they are. <laughs> right. And I... Uh, and uh, but what the Equal Rights Amendment was saying that the federal the federal government could could enforce you know equal rights across the board and one of the things your mother also seemed um, uh, the biggest drawbacks of that is that therefore women could be drafted into a war um, and then also one of the what was her what was her what was her main talking point when it came to divorces well in the nineteen seventies she was very worried about. Um, stay-at-home wives and mothers being supported by their husbands. And there were laws requiring that husbands support their wives and children. Now, the military is a very important question because if you say you cannot have any laws that discriminate on the basis of sex, then women are, are subject to, excuse me, <coughs> women would be subject to the draft and to um, frontline combat duty. And I don't think that helps women, and I don't think it helps the military force. Right. Nor do I think women actually want that. <laughs> <laughs> Equality is a great idea, but when it comes to equal treatment well, across the board? Yeah. We have an all-volunteer army today, and women uh, make up about 15% of the volunteer mm -hmm. army today. But once you're in the military, you're not a volunteer. You go where you're ordered to go. And if you're ordered to go to the front combat front lines, then you have to go. Mm -hmm. And no less an authority than Ruth Bader Ginsburg, justice on the Supreme Court has said that under ERA, it would mean equal representation on the combat front line. Yeah, that's bothersome. It, uh, it, it kind of folds into this idea that I've talked about on the show when it comes to, um, have you ever heard of the hashtag Oscars so white? Yes. Yes. So mm -hmm. if, we, if, we, if we really extrapolate even Stephen's behavior and even Stephen's language, I think uh, what we therefore would need is that, is that black people represent 14% of our Oscars and women represent 52, you know, 51%. If we well, had to you're, go Peter, across you're getting the board, back to equality of outcome. And as right. we know, there are huge differences across the board among human beings. And so are we going to have equality of outcome on basketball teams? I mean, it becomes ludicrous after a while. Right. Are we going to have, are we going to have MMA fighters between, you know, male and female fighters? That would be, and they don't want it either. Yeah. So um, now uh, the ERA, that Equal Rights uh, Amendment, it was debated very hotly in the 70s. Um, and, so, you know, I've seen a lot of videos when it comes to um, debates between your mother and, um, what was that big one? Your mother and... Betty Friedan? Yeah, that was the one. <clears throat> And I haven't done a lot of research into her, um, but uh, it does. It did seem like she was not as prepared. Your mother seemed to be a very smart, very prepared person. Um, it seems like you've got actually she gotten a lot. Your homework. She did, yes, uh, and also wasn't afraid to on the on the on the show stop wherever she was and say, no, 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 I don't think that's right. And mm -hmm. she wasn't. A, she wasn't a. Um, it seemed like actually Betty for Dan was was less prepared. <laughs> Betty for Dan, as as much as equal rights is a great idea, um, you know, you do have to kind of you do have to um, be willing to kind of be a dog in, in a fight if you're in a fight, you know. And I think she was that. Your mother was. She loved debating. She loved going into the fray. One of the things that she did was that she did countless hundreds of speeches on college campuses, which were a hostile environment even back then. But those, really? were, those were debates that, and speeches that she really enjoyed doing. It was all, for her, it was like doing missionary work. 
Nice. Did you ever go with her to these debates? Well, she spoke at my college campus while I was a, a student. <laughs> oh, no. Did they have to, like, quarantine you off to make sure that you didn't get any any fights in the back of your head? No, I, I, I wasn't worried about that. But there was a group of women who uh, had uh, draped themselves in chains and rattled the chains during the entire speech. Ay, ay, ay. Because part of feminism is to believe you're a victim and that you are enchained. And what my mother did not believe in victims. My mother said, you're a product of your circumstances. Don't be a victim. Right. We've all had a lot of crazy stuff going on. As an example, I moved, you know, I moved to, uh, to New York and I, I finally got into this place in, in, the, uh, uh, in the Hell's Kitchen district of Manhattan. And as soon as I signed the lease, my job told me that we actually have to we have to stop because it's uh, coronavirus time. And so my job has been on hold and I've got some financial fear and I'm, I'm not sure what to do. And I and honestly, the more over the last few days. I have the opportunity to focus on, isn't this awful? Isn't this horrendous? What am I going to do? This is, I can't do anything. The the world is all against me, you know. I fear martial law more than I fear coronavirus. (laughs) I can hear that. Yeah, I can hear that. Yeah. And so, but I have an opportunity to either be negative that way or I have an opportunity to see, okay, what can I do? And it seems like you're right. It seems like the victim mentality of the feminists or, or Black Lives Matter or whatever, it, as much as the impetus might be all the way down at the bottom, it, or the impetus might be, let's do something good for women or let's do something good for the marginalized. It gets perverted very quickly into something that is about power hungriness. It's about power. Yes. It's not about... Uh, it's not about freedom for anybody else. It's not about real justice. It's about power. And that's what bothers me. One of the um, worst parts about the proposed ERA is Section 2. And the proponents never like to talk about Section 2. But that is a wholesale transfer of power from state and local government to national government. And I am not confident in giving our federal government any more power than they have al- than they already have or have already taken. In fact, I think they have too much power now. But Section 2 says that Congress shall enforce the provisions of Section 1. It's not an option. Congress shall. So any law dealing with sex becomes the purview of Congress to adjudic- to, to, to uh, uh, pass leg- legislation to enforce. Were the Betty for Dan's or, you know, or any of the workers on that side, um, were they ever in the, were they ever willing to change the wording? Were they ever um, willing to amend the amendment? No, because that actually was attempted in 1972 when it was first proposed to Congress. There were eight or ten amendments that would have excluded some of the um, the worst parts about becoming a sex-neutral society, such as the military. And all of those amendments were rejected by the proponents. Do, do you remember the wording? Do you remember why they wanted... Because. <laughs> From the research I did, the Betty for Dan's, et cetera, said that they they didn't they didn't think that it actually would um, would open the door wide enough for women to be drafted. So now it sounds like when it came to let's put that in writing, they weren't willing to do that. Correct. That is that is correct. I I think I think the proponents of ERA really do want a sex neutral society. They want men and women to be interchangeable in every circumstance. Right. Here's a here's an interesting question. And maybe I mean, there's lots of different uh, options and lots of different ways to look at this. But what do you think is the intention behind that level of obstinate uh, feminism, that fourth wave, third wave feminism? Uh, What do you feel is the intention behind it? As an example for me. Yeah. Well, the reason it's being brought up today is abortion. Uh, I think that the. um, the proponents of abortion are very concerned that the makeup of the Supreme Court today will chip away at Roe v. Wade. And they see this, putting this back in, the, putting ERA in the Constitution as a way to, to secure abortion rights. Okay. Because abortions sense. only happen to women, and therefore any right. law restricting would be a sex-based discriminatory law. Right. And we know this from two states, New Mexico and Connecticut, 
where the state Supreme Courts have ruled that the state ERAs require taxpayer funding of abortions. Really? That yeah. is creepy. Okay. Um, I, abortion is one of the topics that I have always been, I mean, I think that's one of those that you, 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 you want to control women's bodies. It's like, no, no. I mean, the more research and the more time I've spent on it, I, I feel personally, I don't know if I'm comfortable enough to say that I want, that I would vote to outlaw all abortions. Um, but I also don't feel anywhere near comfortable feeling like at the very least, the language. Remember, we were talking about the language is so important. The language of, you know, I just had a friend as an example on Facebook post that she was so happy that her baby is growing in the womb and he's three months along or four months along. And she's so, she's so, they're looking forward to meeting him and et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and I was thinking like from a feminist, from a 100% leftist opinion, I could easily post, that's not a baby. It's just a clump of cells. Like, the idea that we would take away that that being's life or that definition just based on whether I want it or not is 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 creepy to me. You know, that language of of is it a is it a child or not just because of where it's located geographically. It's it's creepy. Well, one of the things that's happened is that the science has has shown so much more about what happens in the womb than we ever knew in 1973 when the Supreme Court uh, ruled in Roe v. Wade. The science has overtaken that that decision. Okay. Now, do you feel personally? Um, because I do, I do understand that 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 makes sense. That that's why the the thirteenth or that the ERA amendment is coming up. Um, what do you feel psychologically? Because as an example, what I kind of feel like it is the the intention behind the hardcore third wave, fourth wave feminists. Um, the intention is really just anger, meaning once a shark gets a smell of blood, like you give a mouse a cookie type of wording. That's what I really, I really honestly believe. And angry people hurt people, hurt people. You ever heard that phrase? Hurt people, hurt people. Yes. Yes. I think people who have had bad experiences in life or are, are feel lost or feel alone, they get taken in by this idea of, uh, you're a victim, you're a victim. And they're like, yes, I am a victim. Yes, I, it, it's, it's, not, it's not my circumstances. It's the government. It's the educational system. It's this, it's that. It's, it's a huge patriarchy, a crazy patriarchy, a white patriarchy. Um, the chains and, you put on the inside of your door are much more powerful than the chains outside. <laughs> I like that. That's a great one. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it's, it's, um, I know interpersonally I'm, I'm, uh, 18 years sober and, and I go to these certain meetings and I, and I do these certain spiritual things. And one of the things I've learned over the years is to not be, not to be a professional victim and not to blame and to look for my part in things. And, um, it's difficult to, and to look something. for success in life because we have <laughs> tremendous opportunity in the United States. And I yeah. think any of us can achieve Right. I was giving a ride. One of the things that helped me uh, change my mind about about being a liberal is I was I was um, driving for Uber and I had these two and it was in San Francisco and I had these two um, probably 23 year old white women get in my car and and I was just driving and we weren't paying attention to each other and they were just yakking and yakking to each other like young people do. Um, and I, And I had this thought like these women are not oppressed. Nothing about this experience right now spells oppression. In fact, they have much more power in certain ways than we do. Sure, one of the ways is is uh, um, sure one of the ways is you know um, not getting drafted, but also there's so many benefits as well to being a woman. I mean, just interpersonally, sexually, uh, for those who want to be, who don't want to wait until marriage, as an example, um, they the ball is absolutely in females' court. The ball is absolute. We have no idea when we have a sexual partner coming down the pike. We have no, we try and we try and then something happens and we don't know. It just, it's completely the power is all up to you. You are the pursuee, not the pursuer. And, um, you know, there's benefits as an example of, I was in a room 
um, with a bunch of kind of, you know, uh, short haired, you know, I mean, it, it, and really this applies anywhere, especially if you go into any coffee shop, if you go into any coffee shop, the better the coffee, the more effeminate the, the men <laughs> and the more masculine the females. Um, and I went into a coffee shop and I, you know, all this rah, rah feminism. But if a guy came in who was my size and just started randomly hitting people, who would everyone look to to protect? Who would everyone look to? They would look to me. I'm not going to look to the short haired, uh, purple, you know, like, I, come on, let's be real. Let's you be real. About to a gun. Yeah. You may look that's... to the person who's, who has a gun. <laughs> Valid point. I like that. So in the 1970s, there was a full page newspaper ad that was run, and I don't remember who paid for it, but it showed the picture of a baby. And the headline said, this baby was born with a, uh, a, a, a defect. She was born female. And that's part of the mentality and the ideology that was so prevalent in the popular culture in the 1970s, which was to say it was a mistake to be born female. Now, for those of us who are women, we, we rather like being women, and we realize that that is a biolog fundamental biological truth. We are female, and, it ca and it's immutable. Where in your, in her um, raising of you, where did, where did, was it right away that she started warning you about this crazy stuff or was it kind of after the ERA or was it, was it not? I grew up in it. College? You grew up in it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I grew so, up in it. So how did it feel when you were at home as an example? Well, my mother's office was in our home. So the, the, when the phone rang, it was either, it was either a supporter or a press call or, or, or some activity, uh, because she ran, um, you know, she ran her, her office, her organization from our home phone number. And that was throughout the 1970s when I was growing up. Nice. Um, did she ever, I've had a, a, a I've had a female on just the prequel and she, her mother was a men's rights activist lawyer and remembers getting uh, death threats from feminist groups. Did your mother ever face that? Oh yeah. But the, <laughs> you know, you just let it roll off. Oh yeah. Yeah. Did you, did you ever I feel mean, if you're willing uh, to be in the fray, you know, you're going to get some pushback. So uh, it, it's okay to get pushback. We believe in free speech. Right. Was there anything about, the pushback that attracted you that want that kind of made you feel like you wanted to take on this, this, uh, the baton. Well, I think at the time it, I, it toughened me up because I realized that any bullying I had in, in middle school was nothing compared to the, to the attacks that my mother was getting on from the national media. So you just, right. you just, it puts everything in perspective and it makes certainly made me a tougher person. Right. So how else has it affected your life these days? Do you, did you, um, like as an example, I know that you are, um, are you still, are you still the, the leader of the Eagle Forum now? Yes, I have the position of being chairman of Eagle Forum and Eagle Forum is a group of volunteers. We have, um, we, we have people who are passionate on the issues and we have state chapters and um, we have, um, we have a small staff. We have a Washington staff and our headquarters is in Alton, Illinois. Nice. And what does the Eagle Forum do? We participate on public policy issues. So we, we put out a monthly newsletter, we put out daily emails, we engage on the issues that we believe are very important. We're, we're traditional conservatives who believe in the three-legged stool of conservatism, which is a strong uh, military superiority, a free economic system, and the, the protection uh, of the family and the rights of the family, because they're all interconnected. And, and each one of those legs of the three-legged stool needs the other in order to be a happy and productive American society. Right. Which effectively, when you boil it all down, means we want the government to protect us. But outside of that, we do not want any. <laughs> we are good government. That's all we need from you. <laughs> you know, what do you feel? Yes. I, I 
I definitely am much more a small government person, especially when I deal with the DMV. You ever heard of Yaron Brooks, the yeah. economist? Yaron Brooks, great, really smart guy. Um, and um, and one of the <laughs> things he talks about when it comes to anti uh, anti big government is that he says, "Have you ever been to the DMV? Can you imagine the DMV trying to build an iPhone? Can you imagine how horrible the iPhone would be if it was run by the government?" Private sector is really what builds it, and uh, you know, and innovation and things like that. You know, what I mean, uh, and going the through the taxes it <laughs> exactly, going through the the rigmarole of trying to talk to the government because of all this craziness. I mean, the red tape and the red tape and the red tape and the hanging up and the oh, it's horrendous. So essentially, uh, bureaucrats are risk adverse, and they will take the road of no risk. At, uh, and and of course. What has made our economic so system so wonderful is the risk that entrepreneurs are willing to take, and you don't. And and risk is is the problem with government. They don't. They can't do risk. Right. Let's talk about this this um, series that's coming up. It's called Mrs. America. It's going to be on FX uh, and Hulu. And uh, like we said, it's Kate Blanchett and a number of other stars that are very good actresses. Um, and I'm sure there are a few, there are males somewhere in there. <laughs> um, I'm sure the males are just one sided uh, one sided uh, um, characters. And um, it looks like the whole basis of Mrs. America, and of course we don't know until we actually see it. But when you wh whatever they're building now, whatever the trailers go for, and the interviews that I've looked at uh, of Sarah Paulson, of Kate Blanchett, of all these other actresses, there seems to be this air of how. Not just um, not just of being offended at at uh, at what your mother's work was, um, but the idea that they are. Um, I mean, I literally on one of them, Tracy Ullman, who plays who plays a character in the in the show. She plays. I think she actually. Man. I thought so. I thought so. Um, Tracy, uh, in an interview, said, you know, we need to, this is, our politics are much more crazy now. You know, we shouldn't shut down debate. We shouldn't shut down debate. And yet, when you reached out to the producers, right, you tried to talk to the people who were making the show. They didn't want to talk to you. No, no, no. They had, they had the story they wanted to tell. And it's important to remember that this is a fictional drama. And they have two fictional characters through which they will drive their point of view. The producers and the writers of the show have, have are, are quite clear in their political beliefs. They believe that the defeat of the Equal Rights Amendment in the 1970s was a mistake, and they want to rectify that. Right. Um, now, what do you feel? What do you feel is the best thing that we can do? I mean, I, I assume it's just continue to talk about it and that sort of thing. But because they have a stranglehold on the media and on universities, what do you feel is the best way to go about fighting people? And, and I, I don't. I mean, again, I'm not saying fight liberals to the point of shutting down their right to free speech. I'm saying. <laughs> Shutting down the liberal because at the moment liberals are the one who want to shut down my free speech. Liberals are the one who want to shut down Twitter and shut down all these people. I mean, you know, who who are just making questions or saying a funny joke or 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 just believe anything that's not one hundred percent left. So how do we stop people who are who are effectively cutting off our ability to speak? Well, I believe it's an opportunity to explain what really happened. I mean, they have their version of revisionist history, but we have the truth on our side. So I've pushed out an, a um, website called MrsAmerica.org, and that is full of original content videos of my mother, Phyllis Schlafly, plus First, first person remembrances of, the, of, of people who worked with her and how she influenced them. And then my stories of, of what, it, what it is to how, how I know her and, and the stories that I remember. And so these are true stories that tell this incredible uh, history. Because what I think the most important thing that my mother did was be an inspiration to other women. She was uh, called at one point the sweetheart of the silent majority because mm. she encouraged homemakers to be policy makers. She got them out of the kitchen and into their state legislatures to lobby on issues. And countless women have said to me, 
I can't believe the things I did. And I did them because your mother told me to go do them. And the way she mentored um, women across the country and inspired them to get involved in the political era, um, the political arena, it is why we have so many prominent conservative women today because she led the charge and said, yes, you can engage on these issues that are so important to you. Don't let leftist women speak for you because they don't. Right. Everybody gets a voice. Everybody gets a vote. And the idea, one of the things that it's, it's definitely um, not easy to do, especially for me, because I'm very judgmental, uh, but it's hard not to imbue um, negative intentions with the other side sometimes. And, and so I have to kind of check myself and remember a lot of these people, not all of them, but so, a lot of these people, like I said, the impetus of where it started is a good intention of equality and, and freedom and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But they, the other side does not seem to be doing any checking or any self-policing when it comes to thinking that the other side is, or thinking that conservatives are bad intentioned. They have no qualms with just thinking that all conservative or, or a, an example is perfect is this movie or this series coming up. From what it sounds like and from what it looks like, they just want to assume that the family life, that your home, your mother's home life, that your home life was unhappy. That yes, they present my, my parents' marriage as contentious and it was not. Right. No, they present it as contentious. They present her as like this angry person. Even this this imaginary character named Sarah that Sarah Paulson plays, who was not a real person. It's she's an amalgamation of a number of uh, people in her life. No, she's that means. fiction. Right. <laughs> um, uh, Sarah Paulson at one point in the in the preview says, "What? When did you become so mean?" Like uh, from what I've seen of the actual interviews mm-hmm. of the actual debates. Your mother was not a mean person. Like your mother was not, you know what I mean? And furthermore, she led an organization of women. If she were mean, women would not have followed her. Right. And that's the other thing, too, when it comes to that point. Whether whether they like it or not, Trump won because people voted for him. Uh, more than more than the other side, whatever, or the elector, whatever happens. If In the lose, right states. Right, exactly. If you lose, you lose. If Hillary had won, even as angry as I probably would have been, although at that time I I voted for Bernie and then I voted for Hillary begrudgingly until I eventually changed my mind on things. But if Hillary was our president now and I was with the mindset that I have now, I would not be happy, but I would not start making up all this stuff about, oh, and there's collusion from outside or it's because women hate themselves and that's why they voted for Trump. It's because the black people who voted for Trump must hate their blackness. No, 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 no. This is not people. People voted. And honestly, like you were saying, the, the silent majority. I have had um, a, a black rapper friend of mine who's from the Bay Area messaged me a few months ago and said, listen, I really, I like your stuff, but I can't outwardly share that I like your stuff because some people might cancel me. <laughs> well, it's I, I, I think when you, you get to cancel culture because people have, have lost sight of humanity and because we are in bubbles and we, we use, most people only socialize with people who are like them and, and, and espouse the same views. I've always thought it's very important to hear and listen and to discuss with a multitude of people because it's a learning experience every time. Right. And even when it comes to, uh, to you or the Eagle Forum or, or people in the research that I've done or your mother, just because even if I agree, I don't agree 100% with anything anyone says. Some How people, it's yourself? like 99%. You agree with yourself? Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sometimes I, I agree with myself and then it turns out, I, I can't tell you how many relationship fights I've had where it's like, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. And then I leave and I go to the store and I'm like, ah, crap. <laughs> I was not right. Um, so, you know, uh, but... I don't need to 100% agree with somebody to, to, to agree that they should have a place to speak, to agree that we should have a civil, a civil conversation and civil yeah. or debate or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. 
Um, One of the keys that my mother did in her political life was mm -hmm. to make alliances on issues, not in totality. So if she, if, if you were, you know, a liberal democratic legislature, legislator, but you were aligned with her on an issue, she would make an alliance and work with you on the issue with which you agreed. And I, I think that's, that's very important in politics. Right. And actually, your mother did run for Congress a number of times, correct? Twice. Twice. Okay. Mm -hmm. So she did have that. She was willing to have that, um, uh, to have that be a part of her life. She did not win, uh, but she right. always said running and losing was a tremendous learning experience. That's good. And maybe she might have had more power on the outside of the politics rather than inside. She did. She yeah. did. Because once I mean, you're inside, all, think about it. She she lived in a small town in the middle of the country. I mean, she never lived in on the coast. She never she never worked for um, and and she never worked for anybody. She never uh, was uh, um, um, you know in government or or in any kind. Um, but she made her life and she attracted followers and she had an impact. I mean, right. anybody can do that. Right. Your mother, as well as Betty Friedan, was were perfect examples of women having the open opportunity, the equal opportunity that Betty mm -hmm. Friedan's of the world were saying that they didn't have. You well, know, right. the ability. I mean, Betty Friedan was a housewife in Peoria who published a a book in the, in the mid '60s that sold millions of copies. Right. This is not oppressed. <laughs> this is this is <laughs> and and different strokes for different folks, and that's the thing too that people. Um, that the the hardcore feminists think that your mother saying and and you saying that women should have the opportunity to be housewives if they if if they want mm -hmm. doesn't mean that people that Phyllis Schlafly, Schlafly wanted wanted women to stay in the kitchen. That's not what she said. She said she didn't want the the, the them to be demonized if they did. They, she didn't want the feminists the feminists of that time and certainly of today. Um, who want to demonize uh, 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 housewives or women who choose to stay home and do the work there or women who don't toe the party line of 100 percent third wave, fourth wave feminism. They don't want the you know what I'm saying? Like it wasn't yes. it wasn't all the way one way. She she always felt that the um, homemaker needed to be honored and celebrated and not denigrated. Yeah, that's a big deal. Do you think that the Betty for Dan's and the people of that of that ilk back then? And I think it's definitely, like I said, the anger issue now. But do you feel like it was that sort of thing now? I mean, we couldn't be in the mind of Betty for Dan's or the third wave, fourth wave feminists. But what do you think it is? What do you think it is? Well, I, you know, I do sense a lot of anger uh, from um, from that side. They they. I don't, um, I've always found that the feminists who were pushing ERA and other feminism is they tended to be elite women who, um, who wanted, you know, better opportunities or, or wanted to push their careers at the expense of the people who would be most hurt by this kind of legislation, which are the vulnerable among us, whether the girls or the um, the working class women, or even the incarcerated women or the women who, who sought women's shelters, because you know one of the effects, if we ever became a sex neutral society, would be the elimination of all these protections for vulnerable women, such as women's shelters that prohibit men. Right. Yeah, I don't know exactly what it is either, but it definitely intrigues me. I, I come from a place of, you know, wanting to get into the psychology of things. And um, maybe that's just maybe that's just my particular leaning. Um, did you did you see whether it be when she was running for Congress or did you see this? Did it ever wear on her? Did ever did she ever just need? You know what? I'm taking I'm taking a month off. Every I'm not answering the phone. Which way, what ways did no, she? She was incredibly resilient. I mean, she was insistent, persistent, and consistent. She never stopped. I mean, she loved what she was doing, and she was totally engaged her entire life uh, in her passions. Right. Do you ever get tired of talking about her? <laughs> That's. <laughs> This has really just come up uh, recently with the Kate Blanchett movie. I, um, okay. 
I mean, this is this is a fairly new phenomenon, and I realize how many people aren't familiar with her with the work of Phyllis Schlafly, have never heard of her, and so I, I consider this an opportunity to explain this history. That's great. Um, let's see. Um, we'll start wrapping up, but I, I did um, have. What was your experience in trying to reach out? to whether was it the producers or what answers did you get back from the people? I, I never got any answer back uh, from my attempts to contact uh, them. But, you know, they they have an agenda. They don't they're not interested in other points of view with with they don't want to mess with what their 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 purpose is. Right. What you do know, you feel don't confuse purpose? me with the facts. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, yeah. And I think us down here on the ground level, meaning, and I don't mean, you know, conservatish people or left or right. I'm saying consumers of movies, consumers of television shows, which we all are, um, almost all of us, uh, are getting real tired of tropes. Mm -hmm. And the trope of, I mean, just look at the preview itself. Oh, all of a sudden there's a, you know, there's a, uh, um, you know, there's a, a perfect mix of black, of white, of lesbian, of gay, of straight. Of, there's a perfect mix. In the, and, and it's just like, no, that's not the case. And by the way, the people who look like Rose Byrne and Sarah Paulson, that wasn't, no, that's, I mean, especially the people on the left, of the people who are pushing for the ERA, were honestly very human looking people. So I do actually appreciate that they chose Ch Tracy Ullman. Um, I love her to death, but, you know, she's not necessarily a, anyway. Uh, I'll let go of that topic. But the people down here who are content uh, consumers are tired of, like I, I know for, for for an example, for me, I'm more conscious of it because I, I, I can see the manipulation, but I'm tired of the trope of, of there being a perfect mix of everyone. I'm tired of the trope of evil white person, whether they be an evil black or an evil white woman or an evil white uh, uh, man. It's just the evil white person i'm just tired of the trope i'm tired of the it's a tired story that's been shown over and over and over again and i actually know black people i actually know mexican people i actually know gay people and there can be bad intentions even though they're black they can be downright despicable even though they're black and uh, mexican they can be human they're humans women i know women who have done horrible things you know um and tried to make it better in their lives and like you know Humans are complicated to think that because of someone's certain sex or gender that or or their skin color that they're just automatically or their political superior, beliefs or their political beliefs that they're automatically morally superior is downright horrendous and I can't stand it. I'm tired of it. Well, we are human, and so there's there are good points and there are bad points, and uh, we hope that we always learn from our mistakes and and become more perfect. Right. Have you tried to reach out to them after after they've already made it? Uh, no, I have not. I, I made my attempt last year when I first uh, uh, heard about it, but uh, I and and unfortunately, I've not seen the movie yet. I only have seen the trailers that you've seen, so uh, I I have to go by what I but I can glean off of these uh, little snippets that they're putting out. Right. And it doesn't look it it, it looks like they have an agenda and a purpose that is not complementary to conservative no. women. Because you see, although they're attacking Phyllis, this is an attack on women who, who don't tow the party line of feminism. Any woman who doesn't tow the party line of feminism is attacked by this portrayal. Right. Um, one of my favorites in the world is Camille Paglia. Have you ever heard of Camille Paglia? Yes. Mm -hmm. I love her. And I've, again, I don't agree with every single thing that everyone says, but uh, her her feistiness reminds she's me fearless. of kind of, yeah, she's fearless. And she reminds me of of, uh, of your mother as well in that way, uh, or vice versa, where it's just like, you know, not afraid to stand up to people. Um, and they have the right, um, you know, they have the right, uh, she has the right gender in order to <laughs> to not be shut down automatically by, by that's the, that's the main argument that people have. And which I do, I, I actually really appreciate the fact that I get to be half Puerto Rican with gay family members who's, you know, like I, I, I don't, fit the party line so I can kind of, you know, when people's white guilt, you know, <laughs> oh, he's not 100% white. I can't say half of my argument is gone now. Um, but um, do you feel, and we'll wrap up with this, do you feel that 
I mean, I guess maybe because the makers of the program are hiding maybe under the legal words of based on true events, so they didn't have to get life rights, or what's the situation with well, that? Well, you actually don't, you know, when a person is dead, you can then say anything you want, because you cannot uh, slander or uh, defame a dead person, because the person's dead. And if you notice, with the exception of Gloria Steinem, every person they have in this show is dead. So they... They have the, the legal liberties to say and do what they want. And, I, of course, I think it's a little unfair because my mother would have a smart response to all of it. Mm -hmm. And they, I don't think maybe that's part of the reason why they didn't make it until now is that she's been dead for, you know, a few years. And so now it's time for, for us to do what we want to do, you know. And um, the other characters in the movie, um, like Betty Friedan. Right. Yeah, it's it's a it's a shame because I really I really think that there are a lot of opportunities to tell stories that don't get told, um, and I think people who are like I said the content uh, uh, um, um, consumers are ready for more different stories and different strange characters. I mean, who are the characters that we absolutely love? The, the characters that we absolutely love are uh, the Joker from The Dark Knight, who was very complicated and weird and evil. Uh, Hannibal Lecter, complicated, weird, evil. I think These you're characters... picking characters I don't, necess I don't particularly like. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's good, that's good. Hey, everybody. But I mean, there are certain characters that are memorable, that are people who are like, wow, that's, a, that's, a, that's an intriguing, it intrigues a lot of people. Um, and I want to see more characters like that. I don't want to hear the same thing of the evil white woman. We've seen the story, and it turns out it's not even true. They're willing to to fudge that number and fudge that so that they can remake what's already been made. They're they're willing to change the facts in order to tell a story that's already been told. I, I, and and I no think, wonder I think their their vision, Kate Blanchett's vision is that my mother was cold, cruel, and power mad. And that was not her story. She, she firmly believed in everything that she was doing would be best for the United States of America. And that's why she did it, because she, had, she wanted everyone to live in a better country. Right. Well... That's very, very commendable. And thank you for doing your work with uh, the Eagle Forum as well. It's such um, a pleasure. Yeah. Where can people find um, uh, the Eagle Forum and your work as well as your, your mother's work? How so it's support? all on our website, eagleforum.org. Uh, the website's been around for decades, so we have quite an archive of, of not only my mother's work, but what we're doing currently. And of course, you know, we have chapters in a lot of states where, because we do a lot of work on the state and local level, in addition to being in Washington, DC. But this is, you know, the issues are still alive. They're still important. And I believe that our economic liberties, our speech liberties, our religious liberties are worth defending. Awesome. Do you want to, I'll just wrap up, with, I swear, last question, but, you know, one of the things that I really appreciate about, about groups like yours is that it doesn't feel like, even though you want to defend the family, defend the religious freedom, defend, that you want to persecute the other side, that you think that if someone wants to be libertarian or wants to support gun rights, but also be, you know, a little more liberal when it comes to sex or things like that, that you want to shut them down or shut down their voice. I, I think I think it's always a question of where your rights begin, where my rights end. So if your rights overtake my rights, well, then we kind of have a problem there, just as you probably don't want my rights to overtake your rights. So living in a civil society is figuring out that mix where people's rights are protected, but nobody feels as though they have loss of rights because of special accommodations for other people. Right. Well, you're, you're a very smart and very well, well spoken person. I hope I have uh, been engaging enough and I, I, I didn't cuss the whole time. I'm very proud of myself. <laughs> and I appreciate Start you. Start a new the leaf time. on there. The, um, you can uh, uh, join a club on uh, not, not cussing anymore. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna create a, 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 a dot org. I actually just quit smoking three and a half weeks ago, so I'm I'm doing I'm doing better with that, and 
hopefully soon I can lose some weight and then we'll work on the cussing for sure. Um, so, uh, thank you so much for taking the time and make sure everybody, wherever you're listening, make sure you subscribe, make sure you share this with your less offendable friends. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Peter underscore Feliciano, and, uh, you can support this podcast and all my music and all my stuff at patreon.com slash conservatish. Thank you so much again, Anne, for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Take care. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye.